Welcome back to Echo Ridge in our next episode here in our Ultimate Beginner's Guide. We have a few objectives today. One, we're going to be upgrading this power situation. Two, we're going to try to get the duplicates off of eating just raw meal lice because, quite frankly, it looks yucky. And lastly, we need to do something about all this polluted oxygen. It's starting to get out of control. By using our gas filter and our materials overlay, you can see there's quite a bit of it around the colony. This poses a couple of different problems. One, the duplicates are at risk of breathing in the polluted oxygen and getting what we call yucky lungs, but also it just interferes with good oxygen flow. For instance, in our bedrooms, because our duplicates spend so much time there, you can see there's a lot of carbon dioxide and polluted oxygen to where the duplicates have low oxygen, which is increasing their stress. They're also holding their breath. It's just bad for business. Lucky for us, there's a pretty common solution to these sort of problems, and it starts with pressure management and decontamination. We're just going to select decontamination, which will then start research at ventilation, which gives us access to the gas pump, gas pipe, the gas bridge, and the gas vent. On pressure management, though, we're looking forward to installing the airflow tile. Airflow tiles are going to require a metal ore, in this case 100 kilos, and we're going to put one here and one here. And as the name says, they are tiles that allow for airflow. Liquids will not pass through them. The duplicates will still be able to stand on them. And more importantly, carbon dioxide will be able to flow through it. And you can see it's not taking it very long for the carbon dioxide that naturally sinks because it is a heavier gas to fall into the bathroom. And you might think, well, I'm going to also put airflow tiles in the bathroom as well. And then on this row to get it all the way down to our carbon sink floor. This would be a mistake, and I'll show you why in just a minute, once Pei finishes up research on decontamination. Our ladder shaft here only has a one tile distance from one side of it to the other. And as we've talked about before, this can cause problems with appropriate oxygen flow and allowing all that carbon dioxide to escape. With the unlocking of decontamination, we get access to the deodorizer. The deodorizer is a nifty little building that requires 133 grams per second of a filtration medium, but absorbs 100 grams of polluted oxygen, requires five power, and turns all that mess into 143 grams worth of clay and 90 grams of clean oxygen. This sounds like something we definitely want to use. Before we do, a quick note on mods. I am using a couple of modifications to the game that help me make it easier to show you the game and makes for, you know, a more enjoyable entertainment experience. One is the bigger zoom out mod. It's how I'm able to get these nice zoomed out shots of the colony. Another mod shows you the effective spaces that a building operates in. On the deodorizer here, you can see that it goes up three tiles, including its own space, to the right, down, and to the left in the same distance. These are the areas, as long as there's no tile impeding it, that the deodorizer will clean polluted oxygen out of the air. Remember when I said I didn't want to put a door here? As you can see, if I put the deodorizer here, any polluted oxygen that would pass through these doors on the fourth tile, the deodorizer would just straight miss. Whereas if I put it here, all the polluted oxygen can only escape through the pneumatic door. So this sort of makes it a perfect spot for the deodorizer. Note that the deodorizer has to be built on a tile and we just learned that the airflow tile is in fact a tile and still allows for all that carbon dioxide to sink past it. Additionally, even with the airflow tile in its place, the deodorizer can still clean polluted oxygen below it. Now there's still some polluted oxygen being created over here. As a note, polluted oxygen and regular oxygen weigh the same. So one is not necessarily more likely to sink below the other. And if you remember, we have airflow tiles going into our barracks, which means the polluted oxygen can easily rise up to our barracks. So we're going to put another airflow tile and deodorizer combo right here. We're also going to take out this pneumatic door and make sure it's nothing but solid tiles. Now, a couple of ways to get around having to put multiple deodorizers around. One is just not having the barracks directly above the bathroom. Or two, just not have your bathroom create polluted oxygen. We'll get to that in a later episode. But for now, this is going to work just fine. All we need is sand, which we have 80 tons. And now we'll be destroying the polluted oxygen 
all the meanwhile also creating a new resource for us in the form of clay. There we go, and now we should expect that there'll be no polluted oxygen outside of the barracks or bathroom area. Next up is the kitchen. We have had access to the electric grill for quite some time, as it was unlocked in meal preparation. Now the electric grill is found in the food menu, but it can just as easily be found in the refinement menu. Because instead of just refining materials, it's refining food. In fact, we'll put this wonderful electric grill right here, connect it with power, as it does require 60 watts. And now when we click on the electric grill, we're given some options. Now these electric grill production orders will be based on what ingredients you have access to. Apparently we've seen a gristleberry, so we unlock the ability to make gristleberry. We've also apparently seen the spindly grub fruit plant unlocking the ability to create roast grub fruit nuts. And finally we have meal lice, which unlocks the ability to create pickled meal. In most cases, such as in the case of the gristleberry, it actually takes the ingredient and gives you more calories on the other side. This is the first reason why it's a great idea to cook your food. For instance, if we are going from bristleberries, we would only need 1600 calories worth of bristleberry to create 2000 calories worth of gristleberries. In other words, feeding two duplicates instead of 1.6 duplicates. In our case, with meal lice to pickled meal, it does not increase the calories. Let me start cooking this by clicking the forever button because I want to turn all the meal lice into pickled meal. And I'll show you what I mean. Ari is here cooking up their first meal lice into pickled meal. And by going back to our refrigerator, we can see the very first benefit. The change per cycle on the meal lice, if you remember, was 3%. Well, pickled meal naturally lasts a lot longer than regular meal lice because it's pickled. So instead of the meal lice lasting for 33 cycles, the pickled meal will last for 166 cycles because its change per cycle rate is only 0.6%. Additionally, if we go down through the electric grill menu itself, you can see that there's a lot of different meal items that we'll be able to cook in the future, but it also will kill any germs on that ingredient. Now our base is sort of set up to prevent germs, but if there were ever any germs on the meal woods, instead of the duplicates eating it in the form of raw meal lice, all those germs would be killed in the grilling process. We have a bit of a problem though. As you can see, RE doesn't have any oxygen. And it makes sense. This is our carbon dioxide pit. Why would you want to build the electric grill down here? Well, because it's conveniently located right next to the refrigerator. And one day, we're going to get some fancy machines that'll help load things to the refrigerator and from it. For now, let's just build our carbon dioxide sink a little bit lower. And you can see we've actually dug down to a point where we've found even more water. This is probably a good opportunity to put down a pitcher pump and start using this water instead of this water. Right now, this water is acting as our primary tank, but it's also keeping all that polluted dirt from off-gassing into polluted oxygen into the atmosphere. So what we're going to do is just disable this pitcher pump and make sure they have access to this pitcher pump. Now we'll drain as much water out of here as possible, all the meanwhile keeping this one active. We could also be a little bit more proactive by doing this as well, and that's by using the bottle emptier. The bottle emptier is a self-descriptive building because its only purpose in life is to empty bottles. So, for instance, if I clicked polluted water here, the duplicate would come grab this bottle of polluted water, that is chock filled with germs, by the way, and dump it into this pond. That's not exactly what we want. So make sure when you're using bottle emptiers in the beginning, if there's only one liquid available, and usually it's going to be water first, that you make sure you come back as soon as you discover what polluted water is, because otherwise the duplicates will think that all liquids are acceptable here and drop dirty, disgusting sink water into your nice clean water supply. So now anytime we get a new bottle of water, it's going to be dumped in here. But if I wanted to use duplicate labor to take all this water, or at least to the point where the pitcher pump could reach and dump it in here, there's a button down here called enable auto bottle. By enabling auto bottle, it tells the duplicates to go grab water bottles using pitcher pumps and then drop them off at the bottle emptier. And after a few seconds, it'll dump all the water. 
Now, we don't want this to be a regular job transferring all the water because that'd be a bit excessive and take up a lot of duplicate labor, but we can put it on a four. And that way the dupes will only do it when they have nothing else left to do. Now in the future, we'll gain access to the liquid pump to where we could do this by using power instead of duplicate labor. But for now, our crude system will work just fine. With that out of the way, we can now continue building our carbon dioxide sink. We'll open up this level right here and then do the same right here. In fact, we have access to granite, so we might as well just dig all the way over, keeping in mind where the heat is. And that way, all this carbon dioxide will have some place to fall until we figure out another method of destroying it. And then Ari doesn't have to cook while holding their breath. The next problem in our colony is our power usage. As we can see, Pei just got to the manual generator, and it's taking the battery an awfully long time to charge up. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we only have one manual generator. Remember, if you will, from a few episodes ago that the manual generator only creates 400 watts. Whereas each oxygen diffuser is using 120 watts. Then we have the refrigerator that uses either 20 or 120, depending on if the contents are cooled. And then we have the electric grill using 60. So just by highlighting over the wire, we can see that we're sort of reaching the capacity on how much that manual generator can generate. And also to that point, once the battery is full, pay is going to stop running. But because we're using so much power, this small battery is going to drain pretty quickly. And another duplicate is going to have to come over here and start running on this wheel. To the point that if I click on the manual generator and go over to properties, we can see that in the past five cycles, this manual generator has been used 65% of the time. Which means 65% of the time, a duplicate has to run on this generator. That's really excessive in terms of duplicate labor cost. So we're going to go through a couple stages worth of power upgrades that you can do. The first is by getting power regulation and gaining access to the jumbo battery. Once we have access to the jumbo battery, we can build it anywhere along these lines. Take note, now's about the time to start looking where it would be smart to build these, not necessarily right next to the manual generator to save wire, but rather remembering the fact that batteries create heat. But we're gonna put our jumbo battery here because we have a nice little spot here, and also because, well, the jumbo battery and the regular battery create the exact same amount of heat. Where they differ is in their power capacity and how much they leak. Notice the single battery has a capacity of 10 kilojoules, whereas the jumbo battery has a capacity four times the size at 40 kilojoules. The regular battery also leaks 1,000 joules per cycle. Or another way to say that is it leaks 10% of its capacity per cycle. When compare that to the jumbo battery, it may look like it leaks more at two kilojoules per cycle, but it's actually only leaking 5%. Once you have your jumbo battery online, you can deconstruct your old battery, but what a lot of people like to do is save it until they get down a little bit lower, because all of the power sitting in this regular battery is still usable. But if you deconstruct it, as soon as the battery is destroyed, all that available power just disappears. And now when this jumbo battery is filled, the duplicates will jump off the manual generator and it will last four times longer on the same power grid. And considering that duplicates won't jump on the manual generator until that battery gets lower than 50%, it means they're going to be able to go longer between running sessions. But take note, we didn't really change much of anything because the manual generator still only generates 400 watts and we're still using the exact same amount of wattage per cycle, which means when the duplicates do finally get to the manual generator run on it, it's going to take four times longer to fill the jumbo battery as it did the single battery. Well, we can fix that by adding yet another manual generator. The manual generator takes a lot of slack, primarily because it is such a heavy cost in duplicate labor. But considering this is a resource free to generate power, don't feel bad if you're on the manual generator for 50 to 100 to 150 cycles. It is just as effective as any other form of power generation. In fact, I've done a complete series where we only use duplicate power. Now when the battery needs power, we're going to be generating 800 watts. 
which is going to get the jumbo battery filled a lot quicker, but it's still going to be using the exact same amount of duplicate labor. Because yes, the duplicates are filling it twice as fast, but we're using twice as many duplicates. Something to keep in mind, not a big deal when you have idle messages and you have excess duplicate labor, but when your colony needs that duplicate labor to survive, the manual generators and the duplicate labor required could end up hurting. The big message there is duplicate labor is just like any other resource you have access to. And being able to leverage that resource is an important skill that really does separate beginners from advanced players. Knowing when to add more duplicates and when not to add more duplicates. When you need more duplicate labor and when you really don't. Okay, Echo, I get it. But I don't want to be stuck on hamster wheels forever. I want to get into something cool like the coal generator. All right, let's do it. This is the almighty coal generator. And especially in the early and mid games, it'll be one of your most primary sources of power. Like the other power generators, it requires a lot of metal ore. This one, 800 kilos. Now the coal generator is going to require one kilo per second worth of coal. For that one kilo per second, you can see that we're going to get 600 watts worth of power, but pay attention to the other effects. It's going to generate 20 grams per second of carbon dioxide, something we're already having to deal with now, and 9,000 DTUs. That's a lot of heat, considering the warning we gave about the compost that only generates 1.13 kilos worth of DTUs. So for that reason, you typically want to make sure you don't build it anywhere close to where your agriculture is. Eventually, we'll have much more professional heat management and thermal systems to keep our power plants from messing with any of our agriculture, but here in the early game, it's something you have to be wary of. In fact, normally the best way to do this is just move it further away. So we're gonna put it way over here. And what's better than one coal generator? Well, two coal generators. Just like with the manual generator, you're going to need a battery to be able to put all that power into. And although we do have a battery up here, remember this one's generating heat. So we're going to move that battery down here. And then we're going to extend our power grid all the way down here to our quasi power plant. We're also going to build a storage bin. And that way we have convenient access to coal whenever the coal generators need it. Right now, we're sitting at about 31 tons worth of coal. Well, Echo, that doesn't sound like a lot considering you told me they require 1,000 grams per second, which means in the course of a full cycle, each coal generator is going to be using 600 kilos per cycle, which means that two coal generators will be using 1.2 tons worth of coal per cycle, which means we only have enough coal for under 30 cycles. Well, we have ways to get around that as well. With our first coal generator complete, you can see that it has a message of batteries sufficiently full. What this means is because this battery is sitting at 26 kilojoules out of 40, and the coal generator's fuel request threshold is at 50%, the duplicates are not getting an errand to throw coal inside this generator. And they won't until this battery falls below, in this case, 50%. To conserve coal, you want to make sure this is down as low as possible without running your grid out of power. So I'm going to say 25%. And I'm going to copy those settings right over to the other coal generator. And then I'm going to allow the duplicates at a priority of four to pick up all the coal and throw it inside this storage bin. Note that in our current setup, those coal generators will never actually get coal because duplicates are getting the errands to refill the batteries when the batteries are down to 50%. So why don't we lower the threshold on our manual generators down to 10% and by effect, what will happen now is when the batteries get to below 25% power, duplicates will come put coal in the coal generator. If for some reason that doesn't happen and the batteries continue to fall all the way down to 10%, well then, Duplicants are going to get the errand to come run on the manual generator. In anticipation of our coal generators producing a lot more carbon dioxide, we did some more digging commands to open this area up to allow for more carbon dioxide storage. Because remember, the lowest place that the duplicants are going to be on a regular basis is going to be the grill. So 
Having this whole area filled with carbon dioxide is not too big of a deal. But when we did that, our little pond here sort of overflowed into here. That's where the mop command comes in. By hitting the M key, or by clicking this icon here, we can then mop up this water. By doing this, the duplicate will mop up the water, putting it inside of little bottles, in which case those bottles, if you have a bottle emptier laying around, will be brought up there. The reason why this is important to mop up is if we take a look at Pei here, they have soggy feet. Duplicants do not like having their socks wet. And this is one of the debuffs that gets people in trouble. Not only do they have chilly surroundings, which increases their stress by 10% per cycle, but their wet socks also increases their stress by 10% per cycle. And if we weren't able to get rid of that stress fast enough, duplicants would start becoming overly stressed and bad things would occur. So remember, try to keep your duplicate socks nice and warm and dry. Our batteries have fallen to the point where our coal generator was just loaded up with a little bit of coal. And for that, we're getting 600 watts, which has the benefit of keeping the duplicates off the manual generators. Win-win, right? Well, almost. Because the duplicate loaded this coal generator with 200 kilos worth of coal, even when this jumbo battery is chock full, because the coal generator still has coal to burn, it's still going to run. But notice there's no more space to throw power into the jumbo battery. So you're literally just wasting coal at this point. But for a basic system, this isn't too bad. One thing you could do to curtail this is by adding more batteries so that there is more capacity on your grid for power. So as the coal generator is using the rest of its coal, the power being generated has a place to go. But notice, now that the coal generator doesn't have at least one kilo worth of coal, it stopped running and our power grid is just fine. So this is the reason why you're not actually going to use 600 kilos worth of coal, especially if you're smart with where you put this fuel request threshold. Because if it's up at 50%, well, the duplicate's gonna come carry and throw coal into the coal generator as much as they can carry and the coal generator is going to keep burning it until it's empty. So the lower you can get this number, the more power you're going to be able to generate and keep inside this battery without going over its max capacity. That seems sort of cumbersome. You're telling me there's not an easier or better way to do that? Well, yes, there is. And that's by use of the smart battery. But unfortunately, we can't just go right at the smart battery. We're going to need a rock crusher, and after the rock crusher, we're gonna need some automation wire as well. And while I like having multiple batteries on the power grid when you're running coal generators, that way they don't overfill like we spoke about, there's no reason to have more heat generation right next to our wonderful mealwoods, so we're gonna get rid of it. Here's another example of our jumbo battery being chock full and the coal generator continuously burning coal. And this time it looks like we're wasting about 150 kilos worth of coal. What the smart battery is going to give us the ability to do is when the smart battery is full enough, we can use something called automation to turn the coal generator off, thereby saving the rest of the coal inside of it. But when we highlight over our smart battery, it says it requires refined metal. We don't have any refined metal, at least that we've seen, right? Well, under our refinement menu, we have found the brand new Rock Crusher. Hello, Rock Crusher. Now, besides sounding like a cool transformer name, the Rock Crusher is actually the second refinement building we're taking a look at, the compost being the first that refined polluted dirt and made it into dirt. When you first get the Rock Crusher complete, you can see that there's a lot of recipes you have access to, most of them creating sand. You can take most every raw mineral and turn it into sand at a one-to-one -one ratio, 100 kilos of granite for 100 kilos worth of sand. Same for igneous rock, sandstone, and sedimentary rock. This might be handy because some things require filtration mediums such as sand, such as the deodorizer. In our case, the recipe we're after is copper ore to copper. Now, full disclosure, because it's going to be a while until we get to better methods of refining metal, this is not the most efficient way. You can see we're going to take 100 kilos worth of copper ore turn it into 50 kilos worth of copper and 50 kilos worth of sand. Great for additional sand, but very bad considering how rare of a resource metal ores are. We're only getting 50% of that metal ore 
into its refined copper form. But we know we want the smart battery and it requires 200 kilos worth of refined metal. And I also know that we're gonna need a little bit for the automation wire. So I'm gonna say that we need 250 kilos worth of refined copper. Well, some pretty easy math will tell you that we need to do this recipe five times and it's gonna require 500 kilos worth of copper ore. The duplicate will come over here and let out some frustration and start turning all that copper ore into refined copper. Here's another perfect example of why we're installing this next system. This jumbo battery is already full, but some strong dupe, probably like a Burt, came over here and threw 500 kilos worth of coal into this coal generator. Yet, we don't need the power right now. There's another 300 kilos worth of coal in this generator. So we're about to waste 800 kilos worth of coal. To fix this, we're gonna take our newly refined copper and put down a wonderful smart battery. Once you've finished researching smart home, you gain access to the automation overlay, along with a couple of minor pieces of beginning automation. Everything from the signal switch, the automation wire, an automation bridge, and a duplicate motion sensor. We're after the automation wire. By clicking on the automation overlay, we can see a bunch of ports appear over all sorts of our buildings around the colony. Anytime you see one of these ports, that means that that building has some sort of capacity to interact with automation. In that same overlay, when we highlight over the port, in this case, the coal generator's input port, it says if we send it a green signal, it'll enable the building. If we send it a red signal, it'll disable the building. Ah, this is exactly what we're trying to get at. Take note for future learning opportunities. The automation overlay has a nice little legend on what each type of port does. Now, when we highlight over the smart battery, we can see that it will send out a green signal when the battery is less than the low threshold until the high threshold is reached. And it sends out a red signal when the battery is more than the high threshold until low threshold is reached again. By getting out of the overlay and clicking on the smart battery, you can see these thresholds, high threshold and low threshold. What this means right now is when the battery is 100% full, it's going to send out a red signal. And it will not send out another signal until it gets to low threshold. In this case, it's set to zero. And when the battery does hit zero, it'll send out a green signal. And in our automation overlay, the only thing we need to do to connect all these up is by using, you guessed it, the automation wire. We're going to go from this output into both the coal generator's inputs. Each automation wire only requires five kilos, which means this run is gonna require 45 kilos worth of our refined copper, leaving us with five kilos left. And look at this, our coal generators have stopped working. And it's because this battery is full. It reached its high threshold and started sending out a red signal. And once it did, that red signal went across the automation wire and that red signal disabled this coal generator and this coal generator. Now the coal generators are not gonna turn back on until they hit zero. We don't necessarily want that though, do we? Because when this battery's at zero, our oxygen diffusers aren't running, our refrigerator's not running, research will stop because if a duplicate is in the middle of using a building when it loses power, the current task is just canceled. It's for that reason that we raised the low threshold. In this case, we'll just put it on a 50. So now whenever that battery is 50% low, the coal generators will turn on, put more power into the smart battery, and stop when it hits the high threshold, just like this. Right now, the batteries are sending out a green signal, so the coal generators are on. It's gonna keep sending out that green signal until that battery's power available gets back up to 100. But there's one reason we don't actually keep this at 100. Most people will put it at a 95 or even a 90. When the coal generator is in the middle of its automation and receives a red signal, it's going to keep going through the end of its automation before it halts. And when it's running, just like it was running with the jumbo battery, it's still using that coal even though this battery is already up over 100%. So by putting it at 90 or 95, ensures that there's still battery capacity remaining as the coal generator is finishing up its automation. 
Now we have a jumbo battery and a smart battery on our network. This is not needed. Notice the smart battery only holds 20 kilojoules worth of power. The jumbo battery holds 40. While it's not a big deal, it's just largely unnecessary. Remember, the jumbo battery is creating 1250 DTUs per second, whereas a smart battery only generates 500 DTUs, and also the smart battery only loses 400 joules per cycle through its natural power leak, or 0.4%, whereas the jumbo battery is leaking 2 kilojoules per cycle, which is 5%. So all in all, the smart batteries are just plain better. So by getting rid of all the old batteries in your colony, you're going to end up saving a lot of power and preventing a lot of heat. This episode was a little bit more focused than some of our earlier episodes. And that's the way the series is sort of going to lend itself now, because our lessons are going to more be involved with specific systems and strategies as the game goes. It's not as much of a blanket, here's everything you need to know. Today we learned a lot more about food generation and using the electric grill. We also learned about refining metals and how using the rock crusher is not the most efficient way to do it. And then finally, we've sort of signaled that we're reaching the end of the early game by use of the coal generators and gaining access to automation, saving ourselves a lot of coal in the long run. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please consider liking it and leaving a comment below. And that way, YouTube will continue to recommend it to new Oxygen Not Included players so that they can also learn more about the game. Until next time, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.